Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. It's about time to harvest cool seasoned vegetables. Today, we are going to give you an idea on how to cook with cabbage. Also, garden insects are in full bloom. We'll tell you how to get them under control. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwinds Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Rita Jackson. Rita is a UT Extension agent right here in Shelby County. And Mr. D is with us today. Thanks for joining me. Glad to be Glad here. Glad to be here. All right, Rita, before we get started, could you let our viewers know about your position? Sure. Um, I'm with the uh, UT Extension, mm -hmm. and I am an area specialist. I have six counties, along with Shelby County, okay. that I work with. And I work in the area of nutrition education. Okay. I supervise a program called FNEP, which is the Expanded Food Nutrition Education Program. Mm -hmm. And what we do is go out and teach basic nutrition education, okay. food resource management, basic cooking skills, uh, targeting limited resource families. Okay. So, right, because yeah. you know the push now is to, for healthier families. Yes. You know, yes. And healthy eating. Right. So okay. we try to get families back to the table okay. and just showing them some basic things that they can do at home that are quick, easy, and low cost. Okay. Now what are you going to show us today? Well, today we're <laughs> going to do a fried cabbage. Okay. And I know cabbage is one that people are har harvesting right now. Uh -huh. And so um, a lot of times people want to uh, boil cabbage and that's yeah. that's the the most common way that people cook cabbage mm -hmm. but today we're going to do uh, more of a saute it's not necessarily breaded fried okay. but we call it fried cabbage <laughs> yeah so. mr d not necessarily <laughs> fried now are you? yeah <laughs> with no meat me. no pork <laughs> so we're just going to show that that okay. today so yeah yeah okay so basically what you'll do is what you need um for this is a head of cabbage you need some onion, mm -hmm. uh, bell pepper, and you can do red or green. I like mm -hmm. to do red sometimes just to give it a little color. Okay. And then you're going to need um, some oil, uh, vegetable oil, uh, garlic powder, black pepper, and then bouillon, bouillon. is what we're okay. using uh, to give it a lot more flavor. Okay. Uh, notice we're not using any meat, yeah, <laughs> no that's what salt, I'm looking for. <laughs> anything like that. So uh, this is one, a recipe too, that if you're on a low salt diet, mm. it's one that you can use the reduced uh, sodium bouillon. Okay. And so basically what you're going to do is combine your cabbage. You'll take your cabbage and you want to chop it. Okay. Um, and you also want to make sure that when you're cooking cabbage, if you're going to chop it, you want to go ahead and use it that day. Um, because once you go ahead and chop your cabbage, it's going to start breaking down. Okay. So uh, anytime you're cutting uh, your cabbage, you want to go ahead and use it. Now, so, was that a whole cabbage? Yes, okay. this was uh, one head. One head. Okay. And then we're using um, a small bell pepper. So we're going to use half green and half red, like I said, just to give it a little color. Oh, those are pretty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice color. And then we're going to have some onion. Those onions really smell. Yeah. I tell people all the time, if you don't know how to cook, just chop an onion. <laughs> and people will think you know how to cook. So. Let me write that down. Yeah. yeah. So you're just going to mix all of that together really well. And while you're doing that, you're going to put um, a tablespoon of oil into your skillet. And you want that not really, really hot, but because you're just going to basically kind of saute your, um, your vegetables. Because you don't want to cook them to the length, because a lot of times that's what happens with vegetables. We cook them a little too long, okay. and so you'll start to kind of lose some of your nutrients. So. I can um, tell that's not enough to deep fry. Uh, no, <laughs> not enough at all. Oh, so we're going to put our cabbage in our skillet. Now, Rita, what are you doing, with, doing that? What about the nutritional value of, of cabbage? Of cabbage? Um, the nutritional value, basically, cabbage is really, really high in uh, vitamin K okay. and a good source of vitamin C as well. Um, you get about 45% of your recommended daily allowance uh, of vitamin C 
from cabbage and any variety of cabbage. They're okay. all about the same. Um, no fat in cabbage. Um, and about a half of a cup cooked um, gives you about 20 calories. So not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. Not a whole lot at oh. all. Okay. So after, once you put this in the skillet, you'll let it sit for about a minute. And then you're going to add um, your garlic powder and one of your bouillons. And you're going to add a little water. You don't have to add very much water because cabbage is going to um, kind of cook down. Okay. And it's going to make its own water. So you don't have to do very much to that at all. And then you're going to just kind of stir it around a little bit. And then put your lid on and let it sit for about 15 minutes. Let minutes. it simmer for about 15 minutes. And then we have a finished product <laughs> of what it looks mm. like once it's done. Yeah, that looks good. So again, you're not cooking it to where it's just limp. It's still going to have some crunch to it. Okay. And so um, that's what makes it uh, still have some of its nutritional value to okay. it. So. Now let's talk a little bit about storing the cabbage. Okay. So how do we go about doing that? When you, um, when you buy a cabbage, you want to have it in plastic wrap. Mm -hmm. and put it in your refrigerator. Um, and it's usually gonna last about a week. Um, mm -hmm. If you cut, if you're only using half of a cabbage, cut it in half and then put a little water on the cut side, mm -hmm. put it in plastic and put it in your refrigerator. Well, that's and that's gonna, that. Yeah, okay. that's gonna help it last a little longer, but um, most of your vegetables, they're gonna last a week. Your cabbage, because it's so tightly packed, may last a little longer, okay. but um, most of your vegetables are gonna be a little over a week. Good deal. Week. Mm -hmm. All right, so here's the, the part that we love. Can we taste that? You sure can. <laughs> <laughs> I see Mr. Sure D is can. chomping at the bit, so we're going to let him taste this without the meat in it. Yeah, How about without that? the meat. I was wondering, where's the beef? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also, you know, we don't have cornbread and <laughs> all the other good stuff, but uh, this is one that you can easily serve with uh, a different type of protein, maybe a, a chicken okay. or um, a beef along with it. So. A little ham, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> a little ham. If you if you need a little pork in your life, that's good. Now, really, let me ask you this: so, uh, Are these recipes available for the homeowners if they want to come by the office and pick this sure. up? Sure. Mm -hmm. okay. We can have um, those available to them. We have several recipes on hand. Um, we have if you go through our program, our FNET program that I discussed earlier. Okay. You get a cookbook full of recipes. Um, all of these, most of our recipes are 30 minutes or less, okay. showing you your nutritional value. So if you are on a low sodium diet or um, low sugar, then you can see what the nutritional value is. For okay. That. So, okay. How about it's it? High what do you think? nutrition, low in cost, and it tastes good. Yeah, yeah it tastes good. Yeah, There's no doubt about that. I think that. your cabbage, you can get that mm -hmm. for like 99 cents for a head. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it makes quite a bit. So, um, yeah, you can like feed cabbage. your full family on, on this. So, what do you think? Mm -hmm. yeah, That's very good. good. It's good. So, um, it is one way that you can, again, cut back on your sodium so that you're not if you're trying to get your vegetables, but you're really trying to cut back on how much sodium you're taking in, this is a good recipe for that. And this, these are good carbs too. Yes. Good carbs. It's the good mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. mm. All right, Rita, well, we appreciate that. No problem. Delicious. No problem. <clears throat> there are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. All right, Mr. D, let's control those common garden bugs that we see out there. Where do you want to start with that? Uh, <coughs> we're going to have a bunch. <laughs> I, don't, I think the, 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 well, it's pretty clear that the hard winter that we had, the mm -hmm. long winter that we yeah. had, mm -hmm. uh, didn't uh, do a lot of insect control for us <laughs> because they're already they're, they're out there. Uh, even seen fire ants, you know, up in too. more northern areas than we expected to see them after after the cold weather that we had. Uh, but my advice on on handling garden insects is 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 scouting. You know, being out there, you've got to get out there, you know, a lot and and look and and try to identify what you've got. It's very important that that you know what pests you're trying to control. Uh, some of them uh, beneficial insects will come in and take care of for you. Others, you can use. Uh, uh, the BT products mm -hmm. for, for a lot of the caterpillars, and then some require, uh, you know, insecticides to control. Uh, uh, it's just important to know what you're dealing with. You can't have too much information when you're dealing with pests. <laughs> right. 
Because they're out there, there's no doubt. They are out there. Wow. You know, some of the earlier insects you see, some of the first insects you see are aphids. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they will show up on a lot of different uh, vegetables out there. Uh, flea beetles mm -hmm. are, are uh, another example of an insect that, that is not a caterpillar, and so the BTs don't work on flea beetles. So you'll have to use uh, carbaryl or something that uh, handles insects with chewing mouth parts. Aphids, on the other hand, uh, have sucking mouth parts, and they also are not a caterpillar, so uh, yeah. they won't work on <laughs> aphids. Uh, fortunately, with aphids, sometimes uh, uh, beneficials will come in and help you on controlling them, but if not, then you need to go with, with uh, uh, you know, malathion or a methoxyfor or something like that, imidan, you know, so okay. some of the products, some of the pyrethrins will do a good job on, on controlling aphids and, and the flea beetles. Main thing is to read the label. First, identify the pest that you've got, and then read the label of the insecticide that you're going to use, and uh, follow that label. Make sure that that pest is on that label. Um, if you have a choice of going with one of the softer products, like Safer Soap mm -hmm. and things like that, um, uh, go that route. Use the Red Book if you can get your hands on the Red Book. <laughs> uh, the two uh, had a little problem accessing it by the by via the internet last night, but uh, this is a hard copy. Uh, this insect and disease control guide uh, UT puts out every year. Mm -hmm. This is the 2014 model, so we've got another one coming out we pretty soon. We'll coming out soon. Pretty mm -hmm. soon. Uh, that has a wealth of information, uh, and in it are all of the products listed that UT has found that will do a good job of controlling these, these different pests. Okay. And there is a section of vegetables in there. Mm -hmm. Like I said, when the internet is working, uh, you can access it via the internet and you don't have to haul this big book around and you can bring up the one page that's got the one pest that you need to control. You can print that off, take a snapshot of it, mm -hmm. and, 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 and then take care of the problem. Yeah, you gotta get good control too. You, know, right. you gotta spray underneath because a lot of those insects are hiding underneath that's those very leaves. That's important. When you are applying a pesticide, Many times you might need to use a spreader sticker mm. uh, with the pesticide, such as a you know, teaspoon of dishwashing liquid. Uh, half a teaspoon of dishwashing liquid is probably enough per gallon of water. Uh, and then direct your spray to the underside of the leaves and you know, make sure you get really, really good coverage. It's okay. extremely important. Um, Practice good sanitation. You know, if you have a lot of that debris, uh, like leaf litter and that kind of stuff on the ground, that can aggravate, especially especially the d diseases. Yes. You know that uh, are spread by spores. Yeah, so you don't want to have. Uh, it's really not a good idea to plant, like tomatoes in the spring. I mean, you probably already have your tomatoes mm. planted, but if you got a choice, it's probably not a good idea to plant tomatoes on the exact same spot where you had tomatoes last year. Right. Mm. You know, rotate, move move your things around. Rotation. Farmers rotate their mm -hmm. crops, and homeowners need to rotate their vegetable crops also. And guess what? Talking about tomatoes, there's the dreaded tomato horn worm. Mm -hmm. How do we control him? I, pr I don't usually do anything to my tomatoes until I see that there's a problem. If you only look at your tomatoes once a week, the tomato <laughs> horn worm can defoliate. <laughs> yes, they plants. can. Mm -hmm. uh, and the tomato horn worm, this big, this big caterpillar, this this three, four, it can get four inches long as an as an adult, starts out. It's Believe it or little. not, yeah. it's an itty bitty little hornworm, mm -hmm. and that's when you can kill them. And uh, so, when you start to see some minor defoliation occurring, when a leaf is eaten, one leaf is eaten, you may have a little hornworm that's growing really fast. Mm -hmm. And that's when I would use BT, put the Bacillus thuringiensis out there, Dipel or, or Javelin, uh, and uh, the little critter will get a stomach ache and die, mm -hmm. and you won't have any more problems. But you have to keep an eye on it. And you, in one application, you can't take care of that early in the season and say, okay, I've taken care of hornworms for the year. I'm not going to have any more trouble because they have multiple generations mm -hmm. and uh, multiple moth flights. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, you may have 100% control this week and, and, and tonight a moth flight and, and a beautiful <laughs> sphinx I've moth. I've seen them. They look nice. Well, they do. Well, land on a tomato plant, lay an egg, and scoot on out of there, and you won't know that she's been yeah. there until she starts feeding on the tomato plant. So you, scouting... You, you know, you get out there and then look, you know walk around and look and and uh, make sure you know what's going on out there. You, you know, and you'll also be able to to uh, you know catch uh, the diseases like early blight and mm -hmm. things like that on mm -hmm. tomatoes. If you if you watch those lower leaves and and uh, start to see something happening there, then you can go start your preventative okay. uh, fungicide application. Now, what about the squash bug? 
Because we, you know, we definitely get that question every summer. Squash boar or squash bug? Bug, yeah. We get that squash bug. Yeah, squash bug, uh, they have piercing sucking mouth mm -hmm. person. They can spread the, the, the viruses and diseases that can really create problems. Uh, so scout for them and wipe them out quick. Because yeah. if, you, if, you, if you drag around with the, the squash bug, and I also the, the squash vine borer. Also, yeah, that's you know, another much have to is. go with preventative applications on that. Uh, it's one of the few insecticidal treatments that we recommend putting out on a preventative basis rather than just scouting. If you've had a history of problems with squash vine borers, mm -hmm. you probably need to be out there uh, applying, you know, a labeled pesticide and directing it toward the base of the plants. Right. Um, you know. Yeah, because it will happening. collapse your plant. <clears throat> and then it's no, there's no treatment once it's in there. I mean, mm. uh, you're not going to have any luck. Right, because it gets inside of the vine, right? It just kind of burrows in the, inside. It gets inside the vine. The vine will wilt and die. Yeah. And if you cut that vine off with a set of pruning shears and split it and start following the hollow vine up to the source, you'll find the squash vine borer. You'll find the insect because it can't run from you. <laughs> it can't get away from you. Yeah. But they, uh, I, I never understood why you know plants would kill a plant that they're you know getting a living from mm. you know most insects won't kill the plant they'll just eat on it and eat on it and eat on it and let it live and continues to provide food for them squash vine borer and the peach tree borer yeah. which are they're, they're, they're related to each other uh, they will kill their host plant and um, mm. that just doesn't make good sense to me mm. Mm. me either for that reason, we need to kill them. If we can, you know, <laughs> you get rid of them. Practice, yeah. practice the, a defensive, yeah. you know, maneuver there, and try to try to get them before they get you. That's mm -hmm. right. All right, Mr. D, we appreciate that. Now we're going into our Q and A session. Ms. Rita, you can join us I'll if try. you like. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Here's the first uh, viewer question. I live in a high rise, so would love to be able to plant a tomato on my balcony. Can you recommend any plants that might not grow very tall? And this is Brad from right here at Memphis. Do you have any ideas for Mr. Yeah, Brad? Yeah, yeah. You know, there are two types of tomato plants. Uh, tomatoes that are determinate mm -hmm. and tomatoes that are indeterminate. The determinate tomato plants will, will only, they're also called bush plants. Mm -hmm. They'll get three or four feet tall and then they'll start blooming and they, they, uh, they, all, then they bloom all at the same time and the fruit all matures it at the same time. And so for a patio tomato, that's what I would grow. That's what commercial producers mm -hmm. use. Most commercial producers use determinate varieties mm -hmm. so that all of the tomatoes are ripe at the same time and they can send the crew out there and they can pick them and, and they're done with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I've got several varieties listed of uh, determinate tomatoes mm -hmm. which, which might work for okay. you. Let's go ahead. Uh, Glacier and Bush Early Girl and Legend are three varieties that are early tomatoes, early determinate type tomatoes. Some of the mid-season varieties are Celebrity, Flor America, Kootenai, I'm not real sure where <laughs> yeah, that came sure from, that. New Big Dwarf, and Celets. Uh, those are examples of mid-season varieties that will mature a little bit later. And that's how you can spread your harvest out with uh, by going with mid-season and, and then early season and mid-season so you'll have different harvest, you know, mm -hmm. to spread your harvest out a little bit. Uh, also, um, if you like cherry tomatoes, cherry, the small yeah, tomatoes really do well. Mm -hmm. Some of the bush type small ones are small fry, cherry grand, coralic, elfin, patio, and better bush are varieties of the little small tomatoes. Um, but it'll work. You got to be, be sure that you uh, water enough, but don't overwater. Mm -hmm. and, and I do hope that uh, Mr. Brad does have sufficient sunlight. Want right. to make sure on your balcony you get at least eight hours of sun. I mean, mm. six, eh, you know, you can get away with it, but they would prefer if you gave them eight to ten hours That's of right. full sun. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks for that question, Mr. Brad. Here's our next question. My yard has had purple violets growing in the fescue grass. This year we now have white violets along with the purple ones. What can I use to kill them? And this is from Miss Sharon in Murfreesboro. You're the weed man. Mm -hmm. All right, so that would be me. <laughs> Um, here's the thing about your violets, very invasive, of course, uh, has a rhizome for a root system, produces a lot of seeds, mm -hmm. but it's growing in the right conditions. It likes shade, okay, likes to grow in shade, beautiful flowers, pink, purple, What's blue, it white flowers, uh, wild violets, okay, okay? Uh, like I said, beautiful flowers, but here's the deal. Um, I always like to go with cultural practices first. 
So you have to grow a good, healthy, dense stand of grass to crowd space mm -hmm. because weeds are looking for space. So healthy stand of grass, if you do your cultural practices, fertilize according to the soil test, water appropriately, uh, make sure that you're mowing at the right height, mm -hmm. aerate, if you do those things that can help you form that dense stand of grass, mm -hmm. okay? But she asked how to kill them, mm -hmm. okay? There's a product that you can use. The active ingredient is triclopyr. Mm -hmm. So you have to get something that contains the active ingredient triclopyr. You find that this will help control your wild violets. It's gonna be multiple applications, Ms. Sharon, but it will help control those wild violets. Mm -hmm. Be careful around your shrubs mm -hmm. and flowers with that product because yes. it, it might do a good job of controlling them also yes. if you get it mm -hmm. put it in the wrong place. Because it is a broadleaf weed killer. Mm -hmm. And of course, most of your flowers and plants are broad leaves. Right. So, Ms. Sharon, you have to be very careful. But again, triclopyr is the active ingredient of the product that you would need to find to control your wild violets. All right, thank you for that question. All right, here's our next viewer question. I built an above ground veggie garden that I need to get my soil tested to make sure the vegetables have what they need to grow and flourish. Can you tell me where to get it tested? Even Rita knows I this. I know that one. <laughs> and this is Ms. Sonia. Yeah. Where can she get that tested? You can come to our extension office, the mm -hmm. Shelby County Extension Office, and we'll be glad to test that for you, give you the information on how to get it tested and provide you with the box to uh, put mm -hmm. your soil in and um, yeah, we can do that for her. So right. come to the Shelby County Extension Office. See, it doesn't right. matter what program you're in. We you know. know. We all know. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Ms. D has on that. I'm just going to say, if you don't happen to live in Shelby County, go to your local yeah, extension your local office. Extension. You know, I don't know where. That's true. Uh, who is this? Miss Sonia. Sonia. I don't know where Sonia lives, but uh, if she happens to live in Fayette County, she'd go to Somerville and every mm -hmm. extension, every county in, st in the state of Tennessee has mm -hmm. an extension office and I feel sure that's the true for Mississippi, yep. mm -hmm. uh, Kentucky, Arkansas, and some of the surrounding yeah. states. Mm -hmm. There's a place that you can go when you need to know. All right, and we'll be more than happy to help you, Miss Sonia, again. Why guess? Soil test. Mm -hmm. We say it on this show all of the time. All right, here's our next question, and this one came by mail, Mr. D. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're going to open this up here. We're going to read this. And we enjoy getting these questions, too. We definitely appreciate y'all doing that. All right, Mr. D, here we go. I have a Floribunda rose bush. The trunk is pretty green on one side and gray and rough on the other. There is white powder scale on the gray side. Do you think it is going to live if I put some ortho scale treatment on it? And this is from Mr. Dunn in West Memphis, Arkansas. So what say you, Mr. D? Do we think it's gonna live if he uses the ortho scale treatment? And I would like to get a look at that to make yeah, sure that they yeah, are scales, yeah. first of all, Mr. Mm -hmm. it, it'll be good if we could see, you know, have a picture of that so we could see for ourselves. But I would what if say, it is scales? I would say if it is scale, that it, the ortho scale treatment may or may not take care of it because mm -hmm. many of the scale treatments are, are designed to control crawlers, yes. the immature stage of the scale insect. So if you see the white scale, uh, and it's really thick, you know, it's the ortho scale treatment may or may not take care of it. I, yeah. I don't know, you might want to go with an uh, oil. Yes, uh, that's gonna be off, my In addition yeah. uh, to that. But uh, again, I, I'm not, I'd like to see a picture of that. And, and yeah. uh, i like to see that as well. But yeah, if it's uh, thick like he's describing, then I would probably go ahead and prune that off. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, um, I'm pretty sure they're sucking the life, you know, out of that rose bush. But the only problem is it, it's the, the trunk, how close to the ground oh, wow. is it? So it might be a very severe renewal pruning. If you, may, it may be, and it may have to be. It may have to be. It may have to be. Just prune it above the graft and let her go, come on back. And, um, but like you mentioned before, it, it's, it's best to control when they're at the crawler stage, right? Right. Okay. Uh, I'm, and I'm not sure exactly what the active is in the ortho scale treatment. And, I'm not either. Uh, I would need to look at that. It may have it, ortho scale treatment. I'm not aware of any scale treatments that are sold in multi-packs that may have one product to start with and another product right. for later or anything like that. I, I mean, I'm not real familiar with ortho scale treatment, but yeah. uh, it probably will do the trick if it's applied at the right time, according to label directions. Okay. For that. 
But yeah, like your recommendation, the horticultural oils I think would work yeah, uh, just as well. And cut the air off. Yeah. All right, Mr. G, we're out of time. Thank you. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us a letter or an email with your gardening questions. Send your email to familyplot at wkno.org. The mailing address is Family Plot, 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next time for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center, in Germantown since 1943, and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants, plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you.